you know, and I watched your uh, Grammy. You won a Grammy for for pro- producing, yeah, yes. for producing when you're st- when you're strange, a film about the Doors. Uh, so much great unreleased footage that I saw in there it was incredible. We well, got to remember Ray and Jim met at film school; they're filmmakers. Yeah, and the sound design in that was just incredible. Well, again, I have the great luxury of having Bruce Botnick, who's the original mixer co-producer, and Bruce does all of our audio for everything. Yep, he's coming in next week for uh, they're doing an interview in here with with uh, I'm sure you know Robbie and John for yeah for uh, Ellie Woman. Yep. Um, but what what? Oh no, you, that's for Morrison Hotel. Morrison Hotel. Yep. What did Ray and the guys say? About dealing well, with the alcoholic. About it at length. I mean, and that's one of the things that we talked about in the documentary. You know, is you have to. I think that the key, one of the keys to these kind, of, this kind of management, is you have to be authentic and credible. You know, and if something happened, you have to talk about it. One of the first discussions I had with um, Janice Joplin's brother and sister, uh, Michael and Laura, is I said, you know, she shot dope and she slept with girls, right? And we're going to talk about it. They're like. Why? I said, because it's what happened. And again, these artists have magic, right? And so once you start spinning it or editing it or whitewashing it, you have you I think you take a great risk of whitewashing the magic. Because none of these artists plan their lives, right? It just happened. And so you have to talk about what happened. Um, and we got a lot of stories, and obviously through 20 years of talking with these guys, Jim was an alcoholic. He wasn't into drugs, by the way. He only had acid a couple of times, right? He had acid a lot, but remember, acid was legal back then. What did Ray and John and Robbie say about those times? It was just drinking and drinking. cocaine towards the end. No, not really. Just no? drinking. I mean, I, everybody who drinks does a little bump here and there, I think. But okay. his main thing was alcohol. In the eyes of recovery, by the way, this is just an aside, you know, um, the, 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 the dragon wakes up, as it were, when you ingest a mind-altering substance, anything mind-altering. So there is literally, there is no difference between um, a sip of liqueur at Aunt Ida's or a beer or shooting meth in your uh, jugular vein. They're all equal. Mm -hmm. It's all ingesting a mind-altering substance. So we don't say he's a cocaine addict, he's a Demerol addict, just he's an addict, then that's his drug of choice. But it's like talking to someone who's 500 pounds or three different guys who are all weigh 500 pounds and one of them saying, well, I'm a cheeseburger and fries guy. And the other one's like, no, nah, I'm pizza and garlic bread. And the other one's like, I don't understand you guys. I'm a hot fudge guy. <laughs> it's just, it's all fat. We don't really care. It's all calories. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they tried to talk to Jim a lot. And, you know, it's it's got to be such a difficult position because Jim is the leader of the band. I mean, he's the front man. He's the... He's writing a lot of the lyrics, although Robbie's writing the majority of the singles. Um, and he's got the band in his grip unintentionally, and his, his, his alcoholism has got the band in its grip. And I've had many talks with John and Ray about it, and Robbie, and John's like, yeah, you know, AA wasn't really prevalent then. People didn't talk about it. It was still, you know, these older guys meeting in the linoleum floored rooms kind of in secret. It was still very underground. Uh-huh. Um, and John says, yeah, I mean, if, if AA had been more in the forefront then, could we have saved Jim's life? They didn't really have rehabs back then. The first kind of rehab was what they called a therapeutic community, which really, which was Synanon, which still wasn't 12 step based. And it wasn't, you know, it was based on behavior modification. It was here in Santa Monica. Um, and it was all kinds of wackiness. But out of that model really became this modern, you know, rehab model or treatment facility. They didn't really have a lot of that back then. Um, And so there wasn't a lot people could do. But really, Jim Morrison, he was a good looking guy. He was out of control. And towards the end of the the concerts and stuff, people were going there just to see how crazy he would go. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's basically accurate. You know, because remember, the, the disease of addiction is progressive. Right. And so, you know, Jim, when they started first formed in 1965, I'm sure his disease wasn't nearly as progressive as it was by 1971. Yeah. Um, But yeah, one of the things that that he talked about and that the guys have talked about is that after a while, people were coming to their concerts to see spectacle. Right. But again, you know, you got to remember they 
Jim had been infamously busted at Dinner Key Auditorium in Miami in 69. They had an entire world tour planned that got, you know, the, 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 the um, venue owners had a society back then, and they just decided to ban the doors from all these venues. So they couldn't really tour again until 1970. Yeah. Um, that Miami show was the first city in the tour, too, correct. right? Yeah. So it's like right off the bat, you're done. Right. Well, and you, you know, before that, you know, Jim, Jim was very into breaking through, you know, the bounds of conformity, of, of seeing where, you know, your perception could go. Remember, he was a great acolyte of Blake and Huxley and Balzac and Baudelaire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the name of the band came from that great William Blake quote where he said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, then man would see things as they truly are, infinite. Which, and from that quote, Aldous Huxley named his book The Doors of Perception. Mm -hmm. And so for Jim, it, it was a mixture of art and theater and music. And remember, Jim was a film major. He got his degree in film. He did? He, I thought he didn't drop out? No. Wow. No. Jim got He didn't show up for his diploma. Uh -huh. No, Ray got his, ma his MFA, his master's in fine arts, and Jim got his bachelor's. From UCLA. From UCLA. Um, and they, they, uh, they were um, benefits. They were benefactors of really exquisite timing. Because when they came out to go to film school, it was right at the advent of the Nouvelle Vogue. And so these guys, they knew, you know, Bertolucci and Fellini and Varda and Kurosawa and, you know, Josef von Sternberg graded Ray's thesis. Um, uh, uh, Coppola was there at the same time. Um, it was a real vibrant time to be in film. And, and film was, at that point, you know, it was very artistic, especially like a lot of these foreign directors. A, a film was an art piece. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a document. It was Polanski. more of an art piece. That was... And so, yeah. And, and G there was a Julian uh, Beck, actually his mother, I think. I forget her name. But there was this thing called the Living Theater. And the Living Theater was this theater, it was this theater troupe that broke down the fourth wall, as they call it. And you would go to these performances and they would walk into the audience and they would prod at you and they would yell at things at you and challenge you. And sometimes they'd be fully nude. And it was a very provocative form of theater. And they actually came to LA and had four performances. And I'm told Jim Morrison was at all four of them. Yeah. And then the next night, Miami. And so the guys seemed to think that he was decided to try and do that kind of living theater provocation. Wow. He also happened to be, you know, shit drunk. Yep. Um, Had missed two flights before the Miami show. Correct. And obviously, uh, When You're Strange, if you haven't seen that, it's amazing. You can, it's available on Google Play and YouTube and Amazon. Amazon Prime. That was, it was fascinating. Can we talk about the book, the Jim Morrison sure. book with the unreleased poetry? Just give me, uh, briefly tell me that amazing story, though, how or what was in the storage unit. Was it a storage unit? Yeah, it was a storage facility, uh, protected. Uh, there was uh, 26 or 27 completely filled in handwritten journals and another 500 to 1,000 loose sheets of paper and all the masters and negative prints for uh, the film Highway and shooting script and a bunch of ephemera. And who was under control of that? The Corson family? Well, it's owned equally by the Corsons and the Morrisons. Um, it was originally put into a vault by the Corson family. And then the families came together. And um, we spent years going through all of that stuff. Um, luckily, you know, we had Frank Lisiandro, who was one of Jim's best friends, who was with him everywhere. And Frank was able to edit and to help us explain and give context to a lot of the writings. And now, is the book released? Yeah, the book just came out last week. Yep. What's um, the name of it? It's called The Collected Works of Jim Morrison. It's on HarperCollins. And the audiobook is coming out shortly, which I think we have, I know we have Patty Smith doing some reading. Some, Jim's doing some of his own reading. Yeah, because there was um, audio tapes in there too, right? No, those are available in the audiobook. Okay. And I think they're, we're putting, I think we're doing a separate CD package of just the audio version. Incredible. Do you guys ever run out of ways to market artists? Like, okay, I'll we've let done you this. know. <laughs> I mean, look, that's the artists make it easy. Yeah. They they really inspire us. You know, I mean, you know, 
I mean, every time we're like patting ourselves on the back for some really great creative plan, I tell my staff, you know, dude, you could be doing this for, you know, whoever, the Kingsman. Um, I mean, it is Jim Morrison. It is Janis Joplin. What's the most accurate book of people, if there's an 18-year-old kid that wants to learn about the Doors, what do you, what's your favorite Doors book? Well, favorite and accurate are two different things. Okay. Um, I, can't t- I can't opine on accurate because I wasn't there. The, the book I would definitely start with is No One Here Gets Out Alive. Yeah. And then I would read Ray's book. Yep. And I would read John's book, Writers in the Storm. And then Robbie's coming with his book later this year. Oh, amazing. Called Set the Night on Fire. Set the Night on Fire. That's the first book he's, he's ever He's never even... talked to. And boy, he talks about everything. Yeah. He talks about everything, including his own battles with addiction and his family and incredible stuff that I, I mean, I read so many stories I had never heard. He really lays it out. These things need to be documented. That's why I want to do this show in here, just because right. they have to be put down. And what if Robbie, right. you know, he's getting older. What if he passed away without anyone knowing? And it right. Just goes that away. happens. We have interview subjects that pass away during filming of documentaries. Wow. Our history is vanishing. And it's not only to preserve history, but to make it, put it in context and make it current again. Because great art is timeless. Yep. 100%.